The Leader of the Government, Senator Button. I seek leave to make a statement about ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Mr President, I inform the Senate that the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator Evans, will be absent from the Chamber today. Senator Evans is overseas on government business. Any questions which would normally be directed to Senator Evans in relation to his portfolio should be directed to Senator Ray. I also inform the Senate that the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook, will be absent from the Chamber today. Senator Cook is attending the ACTU Congress in Melbourne. Any, que any, questions, any questions which would normally be directed to Senator Cook in relation to his portfolio should be directed to me. And questions in relation to those portfolios he represents should be directed to Senator Collins. Senator Button. With a bit announcement was any questions uh, to Senator Cook, normally directed to Senator Cook in relation to the portfolios he represents, should be directed to Senator Collins. Questions without notice. Senator Boehm. Mr President, my question without notice is addressed to Senator Button. I refer the Minister to today's labour force figures for August, which show that a further 8,600 Australians joined the unemployed, lifting the massively understated total jobless in Australia to a seasonally adjusted post-depression record of 840,500. And I ask the Minister, why have 152,000 full-time young Australians' jobs been wiped out? over the last two years, of which 23,200 were lost last month alone, how much worse does the government, in its deliberately engineered recession, plan for youth unemployment to get on top of August's worst ever recorded seasonally adjusted figure of 29 per cent of young Australians unable to find full-time work? The Leader of the Government, Senator Button. Well, Mr. President, let me uh, say first of all that uh, uh, the unemployment figures are high, but um, they are within the, the budget forecast, which. Uh, uh, well, uh, no, uh, I mean uh, you sought to make you, you sought to make uh, you sought to make capital at this uh, visit the time of the budget, and uh, that's a legitimate function for an opposition. But let, let me just say that the 9.8 uh, per cent figure, accompanied by a higher participation rate, is, uh, is something which the government both expected and uh, predicted in the course of the uh, budget papers. Uh, <coughs> the uh, components of that 9.8 per cent figure are as, simply as follows, that the number of employed persons rose strongly by 106,000 reflecting rises in both full-time and part-time employment in all states. The participation rate rose markedly by 0.8 per cent to 63.4 per cent, after peaking at an historic high level of 64.2 per cent in July 1990, leading to a slight fall in 8,600 in the number of unemployed persons to 840,500. I should uh, uh, agree, in the light of uh, earlier comments I made, that the trend unemployment rate continued to rise from 9.7 to 9.8 per cent. Now, Senator Boehm uh, uh, refers also to the uh, 29 per cent rate uh, <coughs> in, in the ABS statistics. Uh, <coughs> I just want to make a couple of points about that. Uh, Senator Boehm always focuses on that figure as if uh, it is an equivalent estimate to the overall unemployment rate. That is to say the overall unemployment rate is 9.8 per cent, but the rate for uh, teenagers is uh, 29 per cent. That totally overstates the unemployment situation in relation to teenagers. The 29 per cent rate in the ABS release relates to the number of 15 to 19-year-olds not at school but looking for work. Therefore, it is the total unemployment in that age category as a proportion of a relatively small number of people. The 8.8 per cent figure uh, referred to today by Minister Dawkins 
in his press release is the number of unemployed teenagers looking for full-time work as a proportion of the total teenage population. And that figure is more comparable to the 29 per cent figure which Senator Boehm uh, selected in the course of his question. Supplementary. Senator Boehm. Mr uh, President, uh, I thank the minister for that misleading answer and I draw his attention to the fact that the budget budgeted for total unemployment to reach 10 and 3 quarter per cent. What does this mean youth unemployment will rise to? And I repeat, to what level does your government expect in your engineered recession youth unemployment to reach on top of the official level of 29 per cent? Uh, Minister, send a button. Well, Senator, the, uh, the budget Fair prediction uh, or forecast was, uh, as Senator Boehm uh, indicated in his uh, supplementary question. I thought uh, Senator Boehm, uh, uh, full of synthetic outrage as he always is in this place, would have been happier that that uh, figure is not uh, attained in the uh, monthly figures that just published. But uh, far from that, he wants to uh, refer again to the budget figure. Now, it's, that is a forecast. It is not necessarily uh, uh, a precise forecast, and uh, <coughs> I can only say that monthly figures are, uh, have to be looked at for what they are, monthly figures. You can't uh, draw any uh, strong conclusions. Now, well, look, <coughs> Senator... <coughs> Order. Uh, <coughs> Senator, I, I uh, explained at some length to you, Senator, that uh, in terms of youth unemployment, you use a misleading uh, figure in your questions. I thought you might have got that point and not, <coughs> not, not, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not bounced back like an India rubber ball uh, <coughs> on, in, the knowledge, in the knowledge that the figures that you use are misleading in, in terms of the total youth unemployment situation. So uh, your supplementary question in relation to that is, is uh, how shall I put it, redundant or irrelevant until we agree on what the appropriate measure of youth unemployment is and not a small sample as chosen by you for your own purposes. Order. I draw the attention of honourable senators to the presence in the chamber of Professor Andrzej Stelmachowski, the Marshal or President of the Polish Senate. I might say a good personal friend of mine. On behalf of honourable senators, I take great pleasure in welcoming you to the Senate. I trust your time in Australia will be both informative and enjoyable. And with the concurrence of honourable senators, I propose to invite Professor Stelmachowski to take a seat on the floor of the Senate. Um, Senator Maguire. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is directed to the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. I refer to a new uh, product that's been developed by the South Australian Department of Agriculture, uh, known as the AgriDry, which uh, dries fruits, timber and paper products. Does the Minister believe that the product could have other applications in Australian industry and uh, earn export dollars for Australia? The Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Mr President, I don't always have time to read the Adelaide News in detail, but the uh, article about this matter has been drawn to my attention. And uh, uh, in answer to the honourable members, honourable senator's question, uh, AgriDry is apparently a product of considerable commercial potential developed by the South Australian Agricultural Department for the drying of fruit. Uh, I don't uh, want to go into any detailed description uh, of the technology, but uh, it uses a pump system which uh, achieves a high degree of efficiency, offers great savings in energy, and uh, the project has been partially funded by the Electricity Trust of South Australia. I understand that there are several of these machines in use, not just for drying fruit, but also for uh, other food processing uh, production. 
Not only is the agri-dry an alternative uh, to conventional dryers used by rural cooperatives, can, but it can also be a substitute for conventional sun drying used by farmers because the problems of sun drying uh, are substantially reduced by this technology. I don't believe that the idea has been fully commercialised at this time. Development is continuing with the aim of improving the efficiency even further and these machines in operation have been custom made for specific requirements. Other applications may well be identified as development proceeds. Initial production has been for the domestic Australian market, although uh, in terms of the question which Senator Maguire asked me, it uh, can be said with confidence that there are uh, good export prospects down the track for this technology. Senator Perra. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is directed to Senator Button, representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. And I ask the Minister, is the ACTU annual conference at which Senator Cook is currently attending and receiving his marching orders for the year serious in demanding, serious in demanding that future wage increases be based on overseas inflation rates if those rates are higher than Australia? Will the government reject this stupid and destructive proposal out of hand? The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Button. Well, I, you know, I just take up the first part of the question that Senator Cook, as uh, Minister for Industrial Relations, is at the ACTU Congress uh, receiving his marching orders. Uh, in the better days of the Liberal Party, Senator, when you were in government uh, <clears throat> and uh, when you had a wages policy and an industrial policy. A uh, very long time ago, uh, very long, very, very long time, very long time. Well, Senator Kemp interjects about a health policy, sitting behind. Senator Kemp, you know, been here a fortnight, interjects about a, about health policy. But I thought you were a student of politics, Senator. I thought you would have known. Uh, well, ask Senator Boehm, ask Senator Boehm about health policy. Uh, I, would, I would have thought that was a very uh, sensitive issue for you to interject about, Senator Kemp. But still, you learn, you learn as you go on, and given a few more years in opposition, you might get to the front bench. Now, in terms of uh, <coughs> the first part of Senator Parra's question, let, just let me say this, that in those halcyon days when that once great party, as Sir Robert Menzies referred to it, Liberal, liberal ministers for industrial relations would meet with the ACTU and attend the ACTU Congress as appropriate. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, all, uh, all you uh, one-eyed rednecks over there are psyching yourselves up. No, oh, not you, Senator. Not you. I didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't apply that to Lord, somebody like you. So I was looking here. I, I'm looking here. That's. It, that would be the last thing I'd call you, Senator Boswell. Let, let me say, uh, psyching yourselves up into tough positions, knowing that you were weak on all these issues in eight years in government, uh, <coughs> you can uh, interject about these uh, questions. Let me say that uh, any proposition which, the, uh, a, which emerges from the ACTU Congress will, at the appropriate time, if the ACTU so decides, be communicated to the government. And uh, <clears throat> let, 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 let me say, one always gets questions uh, from this opposition about likely wage outcomes, about how the wage system is uh, to be in the next year. I've had these questions as long as I've been leader in the government of the Senate. What's going to happen? What's the government going to do about wages next year? Well, the brutal fact which you people have to face up with is that this government has delivered throughout its history as a government on, on wage outcomes, on wage outcomes, on wage outcomes. And, uh, <coughs> and Senator, noise. Order, order, order. There are too many interjections. In all that hubbub, uh, in all that hubbub of noise, Mr President, I pay a tribute to Senator Parra. Who, who really was interested in the answer to the question, which is about wage outcomes. And, Senator, all, all the time we're asked these questions about wage outcomes, and on wage outcomes this government has delivered, as distinct from previous governments. Now, uh, the, the, let me say that the, uh, the, government position, the government position on wage outcomes is, 
uh, is uh, in, uh, contained in its submission to the current review of the wage fixing principles. It talks about a generally accessible wage increase. Claims for a general wage increase to protect living standards would need to be assessed against uh, the question of how the new wage system is working. And, uh, <coughs> the quality of the agreements reached and the commitment to low inflation will be key ingredients of, this, uh, of these wage outcomes. Now, Senator, Senator, I, uh, I, can't, uh, I, can't speak, I can't speak for any speeches that were made at the ACTU Congress. The ACTU will put a position to the government in due course, and we will, and we will consider it. Supplementary, Senator Mr. President, as Senator Button was quite obviously not prepared to reject out of hand this absolutely stupid and destructive proposal to pay wages based on overseas inflation rates when they are greater than what is the position in Australia, I ask him, why is the government determined, in conjunction with its unelected masters, the ACTU, to consign Australia to third world status? Minister, Senator Button. Well, Senator, first, first of all, let me say, I, I thought I might have even made it clear to you that I am not prepared to comment about press reports about press reports of speeches made at the ACTU Congress. Not prepared to comment about that. And, uh, <coughs> Senator, insofar as you want to uh, uh, tar the ACTU with a particular brush, well, you can, you can do that. But uh, one, day, one day, when you're a pretty old man, you might have to confront some of the issues instead of making noises in here. S Senator Zakharov. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is addressed to Senator Ray in his capacity representing the Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel. What family support measures are currently provided for members of the Australian Defence Force, and how will the results of the first census of ADF families, which was conducted on March 12 this year, be used in the development of future Australian Defence Force family policy? The Minister for Defence, Senator Rowe. Well, Mr President, the uh, 1985 Hamilton Report and the 1988 Cross Report identified the need for the Australian Defence Force to provide additional family support measures to improve the quality of service life. Since then, a wide range of measures have been taken to improve family support. The creation of ADFILs, that's the Australian Defence Family Information and Liaison uh, Staff, was a major step in this. Through ADFIL's service, families have access to a toll-free telephone information service, which has dealt with more than 10,000 calls, inquiries on a wide range of matters to do with service conditions since its establishment in 1989. The establishment of the Family Support uh, Funding Program with a budget for 1991-92 of $1 million is distributed nationally in grants of up to $20,000 for playgroups, childcare centres, spouse organisations and neighbourhood centres. A further million has been allocated under the facilities program to provide for the establishment and capital improvement of childcare centres. Already a number of the centres have been set up at facilities around the country. The normal posting cycle has been extended from two to three years to provide greater geographic stability and, where possible, members with school-aged children are given back-to-back -back postings in the same locality. The standard of housing is being upgraded significantly. The Defence Housing Authority, set up in 1987, is halfway through a decade-long billion-dollar program of construction and acquiring, and acquiring better quality housing. Well, uh, Senator, this is not a Dorothy Dix. This is a question that Senator Zakharov, uh, Senator Zakharov has asked. And, uh, as, I've only had one, as, the, as you on that side in the last... Fourteen question times. I've only asked one question on defence. Senator Zakharov probably felt impelled to have a question in the defence area. Mr. President, uh, the senators will appreciate from these remarks much has been done on the family front in recent years. However, refining family policy is a continuing process. That is why we commissioned the Australian Institute of Family Studies to conduct a census of members and their families uh, in March of this year. The data provided by the census gives us a very powerful tool to identify whether the needs of service families are being met. Its value lies in its ability to provide quantitative answers to highly specific questions. For example, it can tell us the number of school-aged children in a particular area or the average age of the serving members at a particular facility and so on. 
Assessing and utilising the data is a complex job. The census will be of the most value over the longer term as the results are matched against the national census and subsequently ADF family censuses. The uh, data will provide the ADF with firm evidence to back up its submissions to federal, state and local authorities for access to community facilities. It will allow greater targeting of ADF family needs. Mr. President, the Defence Housing Authority is already using the data to ensure that its married quarters purchasing and construction program matches family requirements. In conclusion, the Australian Institute of Family Studies will prepare a detailed technical report later this year which will allow us to focus on areas of greatest need, ensuring that the service and community gains the maximum benefits and family from these family support measures. Senator Calder. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to Senator Button, representing the Prime Minister. Is the new federalism policy on the care of the Australian environment being negotiated by the Federal Minister for the Environment or by the Prime Minister? Is the Federal Minister for the Environment involved in the negotiations with the states on this important matter, and if not, why not? Fourthly, does Senator Button agree that the Environment Minister's view on new federalism, as published in the Four Corners program on last Monday evening, does not accord with that of the Prime Minister? And finally, will the Minister release the fifth draft of the Intergovernmental Agreement on New Federalism so that the people of Australia can judge for themselves what pattern of environmental management is being negotiated between the states and the Commonwealth. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Button. Mr. President, as uh, Senator Calder ought to know, but I'm not surprised he doesn't, uh, the, uh, these issues are being discussed at the Premier's conference between the Prime Minister representing the federal government and the state premiers representing the various state governments. And uh, insofar as uh, the negotiations are concerned, they are conducted at that level. But of course, in establishing a Commonwealth position, the Environment Minister has an input into what that position will be. The same thing applies at the state level, I would imagine. Insofar as the uh, uh, publication of any draft agreement relating to uh, new federalism. Uh, I don't know whether there's much point in publishing draft uh, uh, agreements except for the titillation of uh, people like Senator Coulter. Uh, they, these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, agreements uh, uh, form the basis for discussion and uh, until, you get, until you get a firmer position identified by all the governments concerned, I don't think uh, there would be any point in that. So uh, the answer to that part of the question is no, unless uh, 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 after consultation with the Prime Minister it is decided otherwise. Supplementary. Supplementary. Senator Calder. I'm disappointed with the, uh, the Minister's reply, uh, Mr President, uh, trivialising such an important issue as, uh, as indicating uh, that he thinks uh, my seeking this information is simply to uh, achieve some titillation, to use his word. Could the, uh, could the minister inform the Senate who in the Minister for Environment's office is involved in these negotiations, if anybody at all? Minister, send a button. No, I can't inform you of that, Senator, and if I knew, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, appropriate position in respect of... Well... Lord, uh, well... Sen Senator, Senator Walters, I mean Senator Coulter, your partner, you've been here for what, four or five years. Senator Walters has been here about 400 years, and she's still making the same mistake as you make. That is to say, <coughs> that ministers at question time should say what members of the minister's staff is responsible for what. That's not, uh, that's not a relevant question, and you ought to know that. This is a disgraceful opposition that, a, that an interjection like that should be allowed. Uh, an interjection of that degree of ignorance, ignorance, and to use the contemporary term, that degree of crassness, that, that, that this opposition is so crass as to interject with questions like that. Now, Senator, of course, even if I knew the answer to that question, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you because it's none of my business, and uh, quite frankly, it's none of yours either. Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. I address my question to. Senator Collins, as Minister representing the Prime Minister on Northern Australia, 
Can the minister please advise what impact a proposed goods and services tax would have on the economy of Northern Australia in general, and the vital cheap afraid? Well, go for it, Senator Watson. And the vital tourist. Chief he did. Said, Robert, you've got him on a platter. And the vital tourism industry in particular. Is the minister aware of media reports that the proposed tax will be struck at a rate of 12.5 per cent? Could the minister comment? Where did that leak come from? We know where that leak came from. The Minister Mr. assisting President, the Prime Minister for Northern Australia, Senator Collins. Mr. President, if I were members of the opposition in here, I'd be laughing on the other side of uh, their face because my source for this is the coalition candidate for the House of Representatives seat in the Northern Territory, Mr Arthur Palmer. And he's all over today's newspapers uh, with it. The headline is, and I quote, 12.5 per cent tax tip in today's Herald Sun. Hewson Fisher gave me the GST details. In response to, I am fascinated, fascinated in these interjections opposite about it'll give us, what'll GST give us? It'll give us cheap freight. Because I quote Mr Palmer, I quote Mr Palmer, Order. while opposition backbenchers have been given few details of the tax, Mr Palmer said he had been well briefed. Order. 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 Senator. Hey, Senator Fogg, how about you jump Order. in when I start to Senator Collins, right? resume your seat. Resume your seat. There are too many interjections from both sides. Senator Collins. Mr President, the opposition call out GST will give us cheap freight. I quote Mr Palmer. While opposition backbenchers had been given few details of the tax, Mr Palmer said he had been well briefed because the tax will have its biggest impact in the Northern Territory where all freight costs will be lifted by the tax. Mr President, that is absolutely true, of course, as Senator Tambling knows. Mr Palmer said, I haven't got a crystal ball. I've been told I had good briefings, particularly by, and I quote, Fisher again. and Hewson. Now, Mr President, I've known for 10 years that Arthur Palmer is a complete dropkick, but now, but now Fisher, Mr Fisher and Dr Hewson know it as well. I did try and tell uh, the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory what a total dropkick he'd pre-selected for the seat, because Arthur Palmer was a Labor Party supporter uh, until, I think, last year, for 10 years. Well, well, I was always terrified he was going to pre-select for a seat. And as president of the party, in fact, I told him that it would be over my dead body if he ever did. Mr. President, Mr. Palmer has claimed publicly that Dr. Hewson and Mr. Fisher have told him that this tax will be 12.5 per cent. Well, as all honourable senators know, and the ones from Northern Australia should know, one of the most vital industries for Northern Australia and certainly for the Northern Territory is tourism. And the Tourism Association has recently expressed grave concern about the impact of a goods and service tax. In a recent paper on the impact of such a tax, and I commend it to senators uh, from uh, North Queensland, it's entitled The Impact of a Goods and Services Tax on the Australian Tourism Industry. Mr Peter O'Cleary said that his association is concerned on the possibility that GST might be struck at a rate of 12.5 per cent to 15 per cent. Mr Cleary's paper says that if this happens, and I quote, we would have a disaster on our hands in the Australian tourist industry. ATIA has recently had first-hand discussions with the tourism industry in New Zealand and Canada, which have both suffered greatly as, an, as a result of an imposition of a GST. ATIA believes that a GST would have a more severe impact on overall tourism in Australia than it had in New Zealand, and it will, weakening the fragile edge in the domestic market which has been won from the Hawke government's deregulation of domestic aviation. It is ITA's assessment that this disastrous impact will be evident on any consumption tax above 7 per cent. Mr President, I say again this would be a disaster for Northern Australia because tourism alone is worth $400 million to the Northern Territory, which is 8 per cent of the gross domestic product of the Northern Territory. Now, in a separate study to the ITIA, the Australian Tourist Commission has estimated that there would be a 15 per cent price increase, if there was, that applied under a consumption tax. The proposed annual loss to Australia would be 125,000 visitors from Japan, Germany, Britain, New Zealand and the United States of America. 
the loss of, in, the loss of export income from these desti destinations is estimated at $250 million a year. Now, that is the tourist industry, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's their quotes. It's hardly surprising, hardly surprising, that they would make such claims. And I understand, Mr. Speaker, and I've had a look at the list, and maybe I'm wrong, that there is no representative. There is no. Well, it's just 10 years of practice, I suppose. I still get into the habit, Mr. President. Lord, I understand there is no representative from Northern Australia in the coalition on the coalition's committee on consumption tax. It's hardly surprising that there isn't. Senator Brownhill. Thank you. Order, order. <laughs> Senator Brownhill, I don't think that adds a lot of dignity to the chamber either. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, but I, I was waiting till the uh, the music stopped. On yeah, the well, I'll run the chamber, Senator my, Brownhill. My, my, my question, uh, Mr. President, is directed to the minister representing the minister for primary industry, Senator Collins. The minister ought to be aware that 60% of New South Wales is presently drought affected. He also may be aware that the New South Wales Minister for Agriculture, a colleague of mine, the Hon. Ian Armstrong, offered some four months ago $5 million for drought funding under Part B of the Rural Adjustment Scheme on the basis it be matched dollar for dollar by the Commonwealth Government. Despite letters to the former current primary industries ministers and verbal assurances from both those ministers, to date there has been no response. When can the New South Wales Minister and indeed drought affected farmers in New South Wales who are financially strapped expect a reply? The Minister representing the Minister for Primary Industries, uh, Mr. President, Senator Collins. Mr President, the answer to the question is in October. Uh, the Minister for Primary Industries provided me with the following response. The Government is, con is uh, conscious of the problems being experienced by the many farmers who have been affected by the current dry conditions. Many of these farmers have also been affected by the downturn in commodity prices. <coughs> Excuse me, Mr. President. The Rural Adjustment Scheme is the Commonwealth's main instrument for providing support to farmers in financial difficulty. <coughs> Under Part B of the scheme, assistance is in the form of in interest rate subsidies provided to farmers to enable them to obtain carry-on finance. Farmers affected by drought may be eligible for assistance under this provision. The farmers seeking assistance should approach the relevant state authorities responsible for the administration of RAS. Commonwealth funding for the Rural Adjustment Scheme has been increased to $160 million in 1991-92. $13.6 million will be provided for carry-on assistance, which requires matching funding from state governments. Funding of the scheme will be reviewed in October, including an assessment of the need for additional funding for drought relief assistance. The Commonwealth and the states have agreed to set up a working party to consider outstanding issues in relation to drought, where the matter raised by Senator Brown will be considered. Senator West. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Is the minister aware that 103 additional schools have been placed on the list of schools designated for assistance under the Country Areas Program in New South Wales this year? Is the minister also aware that the parliamentary secretary of the New South Wales Minister for School Education and Youth Affairs, Mr Richard Ball, in a letter to a Mrs Best of Galagambone, New South Wales, in regard to the CAP, stated that the additional 103 schools added throughout the state is in response to the Federal Department of Education insisting that these schools be incorporated so that the level of funding, that is, on a per capita basis, be somewhat equal to the level of funding in other states. Would the Minister advise the Chamber as to the truth of these statements? The Minister representing the Minister of Employment, Education and Training, Senator Balkas. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, in response to the first part of uh, Senator West's uh, question, the answer is yes. I am aware that 103 additional schools have been so placed on the list. Am I aware of the letter of, uh, from Mr Richard Bull? I am. And uh, are these statements true? Well, uh, Mr. Pre Mr President, unfortunately, uh, and for the following reasons, they're not. The uh, real situation is that under the State's Grants Schools Assistance Act of 1988, the Federal Minister for Employment, Education and Training does in fact have responsibility for determining variations to exist existing prescribed country areas eligible to receive uh, available funding under the Country Areas Program. That uh, is a matter of law. However, this declaration is made on the basis of recommendations received from the State Minister of Education and in New South Wales that is uh, the Hon. Virginia Chadwick. This uh, situation recognises that uh, as State and Territory Governments have the primary responsibility for education 
State education ministries are responsible for the detailed administration of the Commonwealth Country Areas program, including, of course, that most basic aspect, the definition of prescribed country areas. I understand that uh, the 1991 variation to the prescribed country areas uh, program in New South Wales were made following a review of the operation of the program carried out by the New South Wales Department of School Education in 1990. As a result of this particular review, the boundaries of the prescribed country areas were altered to include the extra 103 additional schools. On Mrs Chadwick's advice, the Federal Minister for Employment, Education and Training declared the prescribed country areas for New South Wales on 9 April 1991, which included those 103 additional schools. And Mr President, Mr Bull's statement uh, that the addition of those schools to the list was that the insistence of the Federal Government is therefore entirely untrue. It's part of a dishonest and divisive campaign which seems to be run by, the, uh, by Mr Bull in New South Wales, dishonest in that the basic element of it is untrue, dishonest also in that uh, he claims that some larger schools have been included and some smaller isolated schools have not because of the action of uh, the federal government. The other aspect of this particular campaign that is, uh, I think, totally objectionable, totally offensive, is that uh, Mr Bull and his correspondence, which, as I say, seems to be part of an orchestrated uh, campaign, is running a very divisive agenda. In the last, uh, second to last paragraph of his correspondence, he says uh, to the local, uh, to this particular person, that uh, the, uh, each region has a committee that allocates CAP funds to the schools depending on submissions put to those committees. He goes on to say in that second to last paragraph, there is no reason why some of the isolated schools on the program cannot still retain all or most of their funding regardless of larger schools coming onto the program. This will be a decision for the local committee. What he is essentially doing is dividing one school in uh, the country against another. And it is totally irresponsible, totally uh, divisive and totally dishonest. It shouldn't be tolerated. Mr President, uh, uh, the federal government has uh, provided $3.3 million to New South Wales under this country areas program in 1991. And as we do not run schools, we're happy to leave the detailed administration of the program, including the definition of the prescribed areas, to the state government. However, this sort of dishonesty has to be exposed. This sort of divisiveness has to be rejected. It's unfortunate, uh, may I say, Mr President, that while the opportunity for uh, greater flexibility in Commonwealth state relations is in fact being fostered by the Special Premier's Conference, these relations are in no way helped by false claims about the Commonwealth's requirements as to our programs. Supplementary. Minister, could he table the uh, papers that he's been quoting from? Well, it's a matter for the Minister. I think it's just the, uh, the one document which is public and is not part of my notes is the letter from uh, Mr Bull to uh, Mrs Best, and I'm happy to table that. Senator Boswell. My question is directed to Senator Button as the senior minister responsible for small business. I refer Senator Button to the bankruptcy figures for the year ended 1991, which show bankruptcies have increased from 8,552 last year to 12,991 this year, an increase of 51 per cent. And the corporate insolvencies figures, which show insolvencies increasing from 7,394 in 1990 to 8,567 in 1991, an increase of 15.8 per cent, making a total business insolvencies and bankruptcies 22,267 an increase of 38.9 per cent on last year. Can the minister offer any explanation of why his government, and he in particular, allowed this horrendous situation to happen to the small business and business sec sector? And does he believe his government policies are on track? Order. Well, I'm glad it amuses the, uh, the government, but certainly doesn't amuse the small business people. The Minister representing the Minister for Small Business, Senator Button. Mr President, uh, I uh, acknowledge the fact of the publication of the uh, statistics uh, referred to by Senator Boswell by the Australian Securities Commission. I might say that the practice of publishing these uh, statistics 
has not been a long-standing one. The uh, ASC's initial release of corporate insolvency statistics and its intention to release these figures in, in the future on an ongoing basis, uh, and both monthly and aggregate quarterly statistics. A regular release of corporate insolvency statistics by the ASC will supplement the release of quarterly personal bankruptcy statistics by my colleague Senator Tate, the Minister for Justice uh, and Consumer Affairs. Senator, of course, uh, I don't take any comfort in the uh, release of these figures which uh, you've referred to. And uh, uh, let me say that I suppose uh, the point of your question is that uh, you seek to uh, uh, implicate the government in terms of all these figures. Yes, yes, Senator. Order. Apart from anything else, it is a Order. very serious question, Order. a serious subject, and to have the other side rolling in the aisles during question time. Order. Order. Look, I've asked for order three times. This is a fault that occurs on both sides of the chamber, depending on who's listening to the broadcast on different days. And if it continues, well, it is not rubbish. If it continues, I'll take the broadcasting facilities away. Senator Spindler, sorry. Uh, I, I got to the point of, uh, I'd made two points, Senator. This is the first time these statistics have been published by the uh, ASC. Uh, that the other figures on bankruptcies are released by Senator Tate. Uh, the figures are not encouraging in terms of the uh, uh, increase in insolvencies, which are uh, an increase of 20 per cent. Let me make the point that we always have a high level of small business failure of one kind or another in Australia, and uh, that is undoubtedly that has undoubtedly increased as a result of the circumstances of the recession. Uh, as the recession recedes, um, I believe that there will be an improvement in those figures, and I certainly hope so. Supplementary, Senator Boswell. I uh, thank the Minister for his understatement, and uh, I'm well aware this is the first time that the uh, Australian Securities Commission has put these figures out, but that wasn't the thrust of my question. My question is, Senator, there's, uh, there's over 22,000 businesses gone broke this year, or last year, and the thrust of my question is, what are you going to do about it? Is there any hope for the future? What message can you give to small business out there, whether they should surrender? Or whether they should keep going and trying to fight out of it. Minister Senator Button. Well, Senator, I, uh, I referred in the latter part of my question to my hope and uh, belief that as the uh, recession receded, these figures would improve. And uh, I uh, see that in your supplementary question you seek to make the same point again that you made in the uh, in the. Uh, introductory question. Uh, you asked me whether I should uh, invite a small business to surrender. I never invite anybody to surrender, Senator. I uh, invite people to look to the future uh, with hope, and I did that in the earlier part of my question. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr President. My question without notice is directed to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Button. I refer to the rise in the number of unemployed Australians by another 8,600 to the new high of 840,500 announced today and mentioned earlier in this chamber, and to the statement by the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, Mr Dawkins, that the government was working on measures to create a supportive environment for traded goods and services so that we can encourage an increase in job opportunities in that sector and ask the minister, what are the measures the government is considering, how many jobs will they create, and when will the government introduce them? The minister representing the treasurer, Senator Button. Mr President, those uh, remarks were made by my colleague Mr Dawkins, I think, at 12.30 today, and uh, I've had not, not having uh, foresight about Senator Spindler's question. I try. Uh, I, uh, I haven't uh, discussed with him what he particularly had in mind. But uh, let me say, Senator, that the, uh, uh, the unemployment difficulties and problems which we have at the present time will largely be 
resolved and only ultimately be resolved by uh, wealth creation in the private sector and uh, growth opportunities and employment in the private sector. Um, and, uh, well, I, I'm sorry, Senator, I nearly perked up several times last night, but that had nothing to do with it. Well, that was. Well, I mean, if you're going to have interjections like this in the Senate, I mean, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves in opposition coming in here and condoning injections of that, condoning interjections of that kind. I mean, what do you think you are? <coughs> what do you think you are? A sort of disorganised rabble over there, <coughs> President? It's the, it's uh, it's disgraceful, uh, Senator. The encouragement of growth and activity in the private sector. Uh, as we come out of the recession is a prime aim of the government. There are a number of uh, methods which uh, can be used to assist with that process and a number of inhibitions, I think, to investment in this country which have to be tackled by governments. And I think Mr Dawkins was probably referring to those. If the government uh, has any uh, methods of removing some of those inhibitions, whether they be in the tax system, in, uh, in the foreign investment uh, arena or in relation to a range of bureaucratic inhibitions which exist in, uh, in relation to investment, then uh, we'll make an announcement about those at the appropriate time, which I hope is as soon as possible, Senator. Supplementary, Senator Spindler. Uh, Mr President, I find the answer of uh, Senator Buttons extremely disappointing. He is representing the Treasurer. The question was, what are the measures that government will take? Mr Dawkins did refer to measures the government will take. Uh, and the question certainly is, what will the government do to encourage private industry and to encourage investment, productive investment uh, and exports? And I believe, uh, uh, Mr. President, the Treasurer uh, and his representative in this well, House ask, ask the supplementary senator yes, owes it to one million unemployed to indicate when some information on these measures will be available at least. Minister, Senator Barton. Well, Senator, uh, uh, the question did not in fact refer to private industry and one of the sad things about questions from the Democrats is they never do refer to private industry. Uh, and they, no, they don't. Well, what are you interjecting about, Senator Coulter? All you're, you're interested in life is imposing inhibitions on private investment in a whole range of areas. <coughs> And said, uh, right or wrong, Senator Benitza, what are you talking about? Uh, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the, uh, let, let me say, Senator, that uh, macroeconomic conditions will be uh, prime in terms of determining the investment behaviour of the private sector. And we've been through that discussion in the course of the budget debates and so on. And uh, <coughs> if you're disappointed with my answer, uh, well, all I was saying to you in my answer was watch this space and wait for the next one when the government has uh, appropriate uh, responses to give you. Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to Senator Button as the minister representing the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke. Can the minister explain why it is that in the 18 months since Mr Hawke told the women of Australia that he was committed to reducing the tragic loss of life of more than 2,300 women each year and the personal anguish associated with breast cancer, only $1 million has been spent on the national program for the early detection of breast cancer instead of the $64 million over three years promised by Mr Hawke at the last election. Is this negligent, tragic lack of urgency over such a life-saving program simply an indication of the Prime Minister's cynical disregard of Australian women until he wants to engage in crass politics to woo their votes at election time? Minister, representing the Prime Minister, Senator Barton. I don't have a, a precise answer to that question, because, uh, uh, but what I anticipate is that uh, uh, some of these uh, programs, Senator, which uh, uh, involve uh, large amounts of expenditure, take some time to gear up. I don't think you can uh, measure the effects and uh, the responses uh, to particular expenditures and say uh, if, we, uh, if we spent uh, $64 million we would achieve this result and if we spend less we will achieve... Yeah, okay, okay. Well, I'm just... 
I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making the point that my anticipation is uh, that this is a program which, like many others, which has to, has to be geared up. But let me obtain a detailed answer from the Prime Minister's office and uh, provide it to you as soon as possible. Senator Schott. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to uh, Minister, Senator Collins, the Minister for Shipping and Aviation, representing the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. Can the Minister provide uh, detail about the activities of the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation and, in particular, its role in providing opportunities for farmers to diversify into alternate enterprises? The Minister representing the Minister for Primary Industries, Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, the Minister for Primary Industries has provided me with the following response. The Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation commenced operations on 1 July 1990 to support new industries, small industries and the rural industry in general through a broad-based multi-industry program. It also supports the operations of the semi-independent research and development councils associated with well-established but smaller rural industries such as honey, chicken meat, eggs and tobacco. The role of RIRDC is to take a long-term view of the research it funds from the sustainable use and management of Australia's natural resources through to end markets and value adding to Australian products. The release of the five-year research and development plan on 6 August was the culmination of 10 months' work during which some 90 industry and research groups, including the National Farmers Federation, were consulted. Implementation of the plan will see the, commi will see the Commission take on an innovative role to stimulate a change in Australia's rural sector. It will be investing in research projects and programs that have the potential to provide a high payoff to small, emerging or new rural industries, which will provide over time the opportunity for existing farmers to diversify their operations. Mr President, examples of such industries of particular relevance to South Australia are goat fibres, open fodder crops, pasture seeds, wildflowers and native plants. Commonwealth funding stands at $8.36 million for the current year 1991-92, increasing to $15 million in $91 by 1995-96. These funds will be spent in the following areas. Specific industry research and development programs for established industries, for example pasture seed, oats and fodder crops, rice and sorghum. There will be designed and implemented, these will be designed and implemented to enhance the viability and profitability of these industries, and particular attention will be focused on the creation and expansion of markets, technical skills, ecological sustainability and the development of entrepreneurial capacity. Research and development programs for new and emergent, emergent industries, for example cashews, coffee, deer, essential oils, goat fibres, spices, herbs and teas tea tree oil, wildflowers and native plants, new grade and legumes, new tropical fruits, new plant products and new animal products. Mr President, there, there is in fact quite a, uh, a deal uh, of this answer remaining. I think it's far too long to read out. I seek the leave of the Senate to incorporate the remainder of this answer in hand. So His leave granted. There's no objection. Leave is granted. Thank Senator Panizza. Mr President, my question without notice is to the Minister representing the Treasurer. I ask the Minister why the government, through the tax department, discriminates against personnel who work on oil platforms or on fishing trawlers in Australian waters in tax zones A and B and who work there for the appropriate time in contrast with personnel who work on offshore islands belonging to Australia who are allowed their zone rebates. The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Button. Senator, I, I trust you would understand that uh, Though I uh, do read the Adelaide News from time to time, I don't have my fingertips on this issue, uh, and, uh, and uh, I will certainly try and get myself in that position uh, as soon as possible and provide you with an answer. But uh, it, it seems to point to an anomaly, your question, and I'll uh, seek an answer from the Treasurer as to whether such an anomaly exists and, if so, whether steps can be taken to rectify it. It might be then regarded as a potential amendment. Senator Foreman. Mr President, uh, my question is directed to Senator Button, Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce. Can the Minister advise what is being done to provide greater protection for small businesses against unfair trading practices? The Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Mr President, the problems of small business are always with us, as Senator Boswell pointed out in an earlier question. Uh, but the issue uh, raised by Senator Foreman has been raised repeatedly by the small business sector and a number of inquiries, including the recent parliamentary inquiry into small business in Australia, have recommended action to provide greater access for small business to effective protection 
against unconscionable and unfair trading practices. Mr President, the government has now decided to extend the principles embodied in section 52A of the Trade Practices Act, which currently relate to consumers, to all trading and commercial transactions. Thank you, Senator. I can't always say the same about that. The Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs has been asked by the Attorney General to comment on this proposal and draft legislation which is being prepared to put it into effect. The proposed extension of Section 52A will provide small business with access to the same remedies against unconscionable conduct as are currently available to consumers. The government recognises that this reform will not provide universal protection against unfair trading practices. Complementary measures, including industry-specific measures and self-regulatory codes, may also be necessary to provide protection against potential unfair treatment of small business in particular markets. For example, I have initiated discussions through the Oil Industry Forum of ways in dealing with a range of concerns of this uh, type in the petroleum marketing industry. We've had a series of meetings with the industry and representatives of uh, service station owners and so on to discuss those issues. My colleague Mr Beddle, the Minister for Small Business and Customs, has established a franchising task force which will report in November on a self-regulatory code for the franchising industry. Mr President, uh, of course state governments in, are involved in this and state and Commonwealth ministers responsible for small business have also agreed to examine options for developing common approaches to the regulation of retail and commercial tenancies and improving the protection afforded to small business tenants against unfair dealings. Mr President, these initiatives uh, provide a clear indication of a willingness to address some of these problems, which are generic problems largely for small businesses, and uh, I think it's important that the initiatives be proceeded with as quickly as possible. Senator Watson. Mr President, my question is directed to Senator Tate, representing the Attorney General. I refer to another apparent budget mistake, establishing a new fee structure to be introduced into the Administrative Appeals Tribunal from September 1991, establishing for the first time a setting down fee of $500, in addition to the $300 application fee, with the aim, I quote, extraordinary aim of establishing a more equitable fee structure. Now, can the minister clarify the conflicting statements between what is in the budget, the Senate estimates information and internal bureaucratic memos. Were the bu budget papers in error, or was it just that the government is now having second thoughts about applying a prohibitive second-tier cost of justice to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal process? Minister for President, Justice, Senator uh, This matter has been dealt with at the Estimates Committee, where, as I recall, it was made clear that the uh, uh, the paragraph in the budget papers where it referred to a $500 setting down fee was referring to courts within the federal system, namely the federal court and the family court, and uh, a, a different uh, setting down fee applied in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Mr uh, President, I believe that that matter was clarified to the satisfaction of senators uh, on the Estimates Committee evening, and uh, there is no uh, difficulty in reconciling the two. Could you then, therefore, supplementary? supplementary. Could you Watson. therefore please advise the, the new application fee, together with the setting down fee, that is going to be applicable in cases for AAP, AAT appeals, for example, in taxation cases, uh, appeals, uh, the HEX schemes, customs matters, uh, Australian citizenship applications? Could you give us that information now? Minister, send it to Chairman, I'll uh, provide all that information uh, and set it down in a clear format for Senator Watson uh, as soon as I can. Senator Sherry. Thank you, Mr President. My question uh, is to the Minister for Justice and Consumer Affairs, Senator Tate. What action is the government taking to alleviate growing concern about the accuracy of claims regarding the environmental benefits of a wide range of consumer products? Minister for Justice and Consumer Affairs, Senator Tate. Mr uh, Chairman, I think that uh, most senators would agree that uh, persons these days in an environmentally conscious uh, Australia will be attempting, when they go to the supermarket, for example, if the price of goods is more or less equal, to make a purchase which does the least possible damage to the environment and therefore attract it to those goods which bear some sort of logo which indicates uh, that the, uh, the product if purchased will result in an environmentally friendly uh, purchase. 
Mr. President, uh, it's a difficult matter to judge, in my view, because uh, you may be talking not only of the product, uh, but of the manufacturing or agricultural process which led to the uh, product being available in the marketplace. And of course, there's a question of the uh, wrapping or container in which the product is marketed and how is that disposed of. I think there is some difficulty with uh, making environmentally friendly claims, but nevertheless they are made. And I believe it's extremely important that consumers feel confident that such a claim is not misleading or deceptive. And for that reason, Mr President, the Trade Practices Commission has been provided with substantial funds in this budget to first of all, to first of all provide for a uh, guideline to be issued to manufacturers, retailers and so on, by which they can try to avoid the perils of not complying with those sections of the Trade Practices Act which deal with misleading and deceptive advertising. But secondly, resources will be available to ensure that if a matter is brought to the attention of the Trade Practices Commission, which indicates that uh, a product has been marketed as environmentally friendly when in fact it uh, doesn't measure up, then vigorous action will be taken in the courts to ensure that uh, that uh, non-compliance is dealt with and dealt with by way of uh, a court action resulting in substantial fines, up to $20,000 for individuals, $100,000 for corporations. Mr President, I think that uh, all would agree that where you have misleading claims made in relation to these questions where people can exercise their power in the marketplace to, uh, to ensure that they're purchasing is in harmony with their uh, desire to undertake an environmentally friendly uh, decision, then I believe that we do need to ensure that the Trade Practices Commission has the power and the capacity to uh, ensure that those claims which are misleading or deceptive are dealt with by the courts. President, I ask that further questions be placed on that. Senator Richardson. Uh, Mr President, I asked a question from Senator Campbell on Tuesday regarding funding for the Australian Olympic team in 1992. I said that I'd inquire as to where administration savings could be made by the Sports Commission to make up the additional $1.5 million to be provided to the Australian Olympic team for outfitting and transport. I should refer to one point made by Senator Campbell in his question, that is to the fact that the Sports Commission had rejected the Minister's request to make up this additional funding for transport and outfitting of the team. The Sports Commission did not reject the Minister's request. The normal process of consultation had taken place between the Minister and the Sports Commission, and as a result of this consultation, the Commission made a decision at its 26th of August board meeting to reconsider the matter again at its forthcoming October meeting. As is almost a year before the Olympic team departs, there is no urgency in this matter. I am informed that the Executive Director is looking at the various options which will be put to the next meeting of the Sports Commission Board in mid-October. This is, of course, the proper procedure, and the Board will make the decision in the light of the information available to them. But I stress that the commitment has been made to provide the additional $1.5 million for transport and outfitting of the teams, and that there was never any doubt that this funding would be provided. Senator Short. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, in accordance with the resolutions and orders of the Senate, uh, I ask uh, Senator Button, uh, to whom I've given notice of this, uh, uh, to provide me with a satisfactory explanation of the reasons for his failure to provide answers to the following questions from me, which have been on the notice paper for more than 30 days. Question number, uh, questions number. Uh, 600, 604, 622, 640 and 658, on which notice was given on the 19th of April, and uh, question 1090, on which notice was given on the 31st of July. The Minister, Senator Button. Mr President, Senator Short spoke to me about this matter a minute ago, and I clearly can't give him a satisfactory explanation at this point in time, but I will do so as quickly as possible. Order. Before I put the question for the adjournment, I advise honourable senators that Estimates Committee D will meet in Committee Room 2S3, Estimates Committee E will meet in Committee Room 2S1, and Estimates Committee F will meet in the main committee room at the, at the conclusion of the adjournment debate. Estimates Committee E will be televised on Channel 2, and Estimates Committee F will be televised on Channel 22.